pleasure to have Charles Martin here giving the seminar today. So I got to know Charles a couple of years ago. He, I mean, you, you have a slide or two, he'll describe what you do. Okay, so he, he runs a consultancy, so he'll describe, I guess, some of that stuff. But I got to know him a few years ago, and we got to talking about neural networks and what's going on with them. And as probably a lot of you know, it's sort of a complicated space. And um, if you go back, oh, you see on the bottom right, so he came to the right talk today. So today he's going to tell you why deep learning works. Okay, great. Thanks for introducing me. I, I have a slide of myself. I run a consultancy and do uh, basically consulting for clients the, doing AI and machine learning. They hire us to help them solve problems and get products into production. So we focus on the area of taking really academic research or research that's been developed and putting it into production, building prototypes and getting these things into uh, out in front of their customers and generating revenue. Uh, and in the course of doing this, um, I've been working in AI for a very long time. In fact, I did my postdoctoral work at, uh, in theoretical physics at Champaign-Urbana. We were studying the statistical physics of neural networks. And amazingly, all this stuff has come back. So uh, Michael and I have been talking now for uh, probably about three years, I think. Maybe more about you know, how to approach this problem. Uh, uh, here's a slide on Michael, but uh, since you all know him, I'll skip it. And it started off with, this, this sort of started off with um, this paper that came out by Lee Kun in 2015 where they were comparing the energy landscape of a neural network to that of a Gaussian spin glass. Some, and you know, I have some background in the spin glass theory. And I read this paper and I looked at it and I said, this, this doesn't look right at all. This is totally wrong. These are not Gaussian, they're not Gaussian systems. They're not Gaussian spin glasses. And in fact, I, I sort of pointed out that to Michael, so look, I found this old paper um, uh, in protein folding. And so if you, the, the idea was that there was this paper by Lee Kun and they, they run these simulations and they show that the neural network has this structure of its, how, what the test data looks like uh, after running it and they claim, well, this looks like a spin glass. I said, well, there's a model in protein folding, an empirical model. It has exactly the same distribution. It's a completely different model. So th this just isn't really right. And so the idea, and Michael had, had worked in this space a long time also. We sort of understood that in, in the context of, of protein folding and in polymer theory and in a broad spectrum of theoretical chemistry, there's a concept of an energy landscape. And the idea is that when you have an energy landscape and, and you're trying to fold something like a string, or in this case a polymer which has no connections, and the polymer can fold into a ball, it can pretty much fold in any possible way. And by folding in any possible way from, from, from into a ball, the energy landscape is somewhat uniform uh, across all, and there are all sorts of, of local minima, really degenerate global minima. There are just an enormous number of degenerate global minima. And the work by Lee Kun had suggested that neural networks behave in the same way. There's this huge number of degenerate minima when you solve a neural network, that all you're doing is finding some local minima, and any local minima will do, and that the global minima is some state of overtraining. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem right. You know, in, in a protein, the, the difference between a protein and a polymer is that a protein has very, very specific connections between one part of the protein and another. So it might be tied in this way. And this restricts the landscape. It restricts the space of folding. So when you try to fold this polymer, the string, which has all these very specific connections, it will actually fold, in, in nature, it actually folds to a very specific state. And so maybe you, know, you would find that there's one global minima called the native conformation. There might be some other nearby minima, which are pretty close. and then. then yeah, and then different proteins maybe have two minima or three, and they can move between one and the other. But for the most part, these things are not a huge number of, uh, and there's not a huge number of global minima that you would, or, or nearly degenerate global minima. It's just that this picture seemed wrong, and Michael and I got to talking about this. We said, yeah, this, this just can't be right. And, and so this motivated us to ask you know, a, a number of deep theoretical questions, you know, like, like how is it that protein, uh, deep learning, is able to solve what is seemingly this massive non-convex optimization problem. And yet, all, in, in many cases, doesn't, in, in, in practice, does not seem to be non-convex at all. Uh, uh, how does regularization work in these systems? There was a paper that came out that suggested regularization is quite different than what we would see machine learning. Why are deeper networks better? Uh, you know, why, do, why not wide networks? Why do deep networks work so well? And, th and then, uh, what is the correct theoretical framework 
to look at. I mean, in, in machine learning, we have a VC theory. You know, I studied in, in school statistical mechanics. And at that time, in the late 90s, neural networks were part of the purview of statistical mechanics. And we have a lot of rich literature from statistical mechanics on how these systems work. But clearly, what's going on today in practice is quite different than what we were doing in the 90s. And so there must be, there's some real differences here. From, from a practical point of view, you know, from my perspective, I look at something like VC theory and I go, okay, uh, how do I use this with a client? Clients, well, and what do you mean? You know, if you're, you know, when you're a physicist and you have a theory like Maxwell's equations or Newton's equations, you use that theory. You use it to do things. And I, I always felt that these theories, there's something not, there's missing that I can't really use them. So I want to ask, you know, how can we provide useful insight to improve engineering? Uh, questions like, when is a network fully optimized? You know, that's a real problem. You know, how do you know if you train a network that this is the best optimal, that this network is as good as you can get and you shouldn't spend another $50,000 training it because you'll do so much better. Uh, why can't you use large batch sizes? Why there's this weird phenomenon that when you use large batch sizes, which presumably would speed up the calculations, and, and at least in some architectures, why, why doesn't it work? How can you do weekly, deep super, weekly supervised deep learning? I have clients come to me all the time they have small data sets. Maybe they have a few thousand labeled examples and they want to build systems. They need to do this. You know, how do you, how do, you do this for them? So these, this sort of, we have this combination of what I call theoretical and practical questions. And today what I'd like to do is discuss some of the work we've been doing over the past year and try to, at the end I'm going to present a tool that we've built that hopefully will solve some of these problems. So I just want to set the problem up by just to sort of set up the math, we have this notion of what I call an energy landscape. And by that, very specific, just you have in a neural network, you have, uh, you have these inputs, which is your data, and you have labels, and the neural network is trying to guess the labels from the input. So you feed data in, it passes through some hidden layers, there are these weights and biases, and in the end, you try to predict uh, the labels. And you do this over and over and over again by minimizing some function, which is a loss function, of the energy function applied to each of the data points minus the label. This, this is just a basic, basic setup where W is the weight matrix and H is some activation function. And, and the challenge, and the challenge has always been, not how, how do you minimize this thing? Because we, we, we could do that in, you know, you just give it a huge amount of data and let the, let the capacity be uh, uh, very, very large and give it a lot of data. But, the point is you can, you can tend to overtrain. So it's like, how do you minimize this without overtraining is really the challenge. And, and sort of pose this question that I had, which was, well, why can't I just look at the network and look at the weights and see if it's overtrained or not? Why do I have to look at the test data to tell if it's overtrained? Can't I just look like, like, like you might do static analysis of a software, a piece of software. Why can't I just do static analysis and look at these weights and try to ask myself, is this system overtrained or not? And so that's sort of where the, the puzzle began. I can't answer that question yet, but I can answer something more interesting today. Today I can tell you I can look at the weight matrices and I can predict trends in the generalization accuracy. And, and that seemed to be like a good starting point to this problem. So it, it arises again this notion that how, how can neural networks be highly non-convex which is what you expect from this optimization function. But when you actually run calculations and you were to look, for example, at the Hessian as you run this thing, you actually find that it's, it's convex everywhere. You just go, you're always going downhill. Well, this in fact was, this, this has been a lot of controversy, a lot of people talking about this. This was actually known in the late 90s. In fact, I dug up a book by um, Duda, Hart, and Stork. And you know, it basically is an old orange book, which is on pattern classification. And this is, you know, from 2000, uh, whatever the version I have. And, you know, it's almost 20 years old. And even back then, it was, it was suggested that when you're in a low dimensional space, local minima can be plentiful. In high dimensional spaces, the problem of local minima is different. The high dimensional space may afford more ways or dimensions for the system to get around barriers or local maximum during learning. So the more superfluous the weights, the less likely it is the network will get trapped in local minima. So it was sort of we understood this back in the 90s that, look, these things don't suffer from problems of local minima. In fact, I even, I even comment, anyone who thinks that these systems suffer from local minima really haven't read some of the old literature or studied some of the work by Lee Kun, which is known for a long time. The question is, what, what happened to all the minima? Well, what's going on here? And 
And how do you avoid overtraining? And generally what you would do is you add more capacity and you regularize. That, that's how we do it in machine learning. We add capacity and we regularize. And that's, that's how you avoid overtraining. Well, in, in 2017, a couple years ago, there was this paper that came out. And they suggested that when you take large models and you fit them on randomly labeled data. So I take some of the data and randomly label some of the data that, that neural networks will always fit randomly labeled data. And then you cannot, regularization can't prevent this. This is very odd. I mean, you would not expect this. You would expect if I over-regularize, at least I can get, you know, 10% accuracy, 20%, I can get something. But you get nothing. Um, and it sort of got this idea that, that understanding deep learning somehow requires rethinking generalization, at least how we think about generalization in machine learning. And, and uh, you know, in, in neural networks, we think about regularization. There's almost everything you do is regularization. You know, in, in machine learning, you know, you, you, you constrain the norm. You put a norm constraint on, that's regularization. In deep learning, you, know, you have dropout. You can, you, can, you can decrease the batch size. That seems to act like a regularizer. You can noisify some of the data. That seems to act like a regularizer. In fact, there's a nice paper here I dug up, which I think has maybe 50 or so different things that are done in deep learning, all of which appear to be regularization. So, you know, we sort of say in the paper we wrote, you know, every, every adjustable knob and switch is called regularization in deep learning. And, you know, in, in order to really study regularization, we, you know, we have to, we'd like to isolate, we'd like to isolate what we mean by regularization and try, try to look at some of these knobs and switches and what happens when you start adjusting them, what actually happens to the neural network. So, in, in, in traditional regularization, we think about ridge regression. You know, we, we're trying to solve wx equals y. We, we form the more Penrose pseudo inverse. We add some terms. This thing is potentially not invertible, so we add something to the diagonal to make it invertible. And then we minimize this problem. A, a very, very familiar problem in machine learning. And the insight here is that we're taking a, a matrix which basically is not invertible, and we're softening the rank. And so what's happening is we have some cutoff alpha, and we're going to focus on that part of the matrix which is associated with the large eigenvalues. So traditional regularization, taken off regularization, things we've been doing since the 50s, this is based on the idea that there's a scale cutoff. You can create this uh, matrix over the weights, you create the correlation between your weights, and there's a scale cutoff, and that's what we mean by regularization. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to look at the energy landscape by looking at the weight matrices and by looking at their correlation matrix. We're going to study the correlation matrix and we're going to try to understand is there a scale cutoff? You know, what, what's happening in these weight matrices? What, what's happening in, when you apply other types of regularization like dropout or you decrease the batch size? What, what is happening internally to the network? So in order to do this, I'm going to use a technique from theoretical physics. We're going to use random matrix theory. And what I'm going to talk about is that they're universality classes. And, and this random matrix theory was developed back in the early 90s for studying things like the Palmer problem. I'm more familiar with it from quantitative finance. We use these techniques in finance to solve the portfolio optimization problem and the price options. And so there's a, um, a very broad literature, a uh, much broader literature on, on random matrix theory that you may be familiar with. The traditional standard random matrix theory is, in our case, Marchinko posture. So the idea is I'm looking at the, this correlation matrix. I'm going to look at the eigenvalues. So I, I compute the eigenvalues. And we call this the empirical spectral density. Basically, I take the weight matrix, I form X, I compute the eigenvalues, and I get a histogram. Random matrix theory says that for a given aspect ratio Q, Q is uh, N over M, this density will converge to some deterministic form. And it basically depends on the aspect ratio and the variance. And there are very, very sharp edges. So what happens in a typical Gaussian random matrix theory, similar to like when you might have a Gaussian spin glass, is that you have this very, very clear, simple form to the density. And uh, easiest way to see a picture. So if I plot uh, different aspect ratios Q, I take a, a, just a matrix, some random matrix, Gaussian random matrix, I generate it. Q is 1, red line is Q is 1, sigma is 1. Blue line is Q is 4, green line is Q is 10. You can see that if I were to plot a histogram of the eigenvalues, there's a minimum eigenvalue when, when Q is greater than 1. At least there's a minimum eigenvalue, 
there's a maximum eigenvalue and it sort of forms this bulk region. And even when, when Q is not one, the, the, the eigenvalues will go to zero, but they still come down here and there's a very, very crisp cutoff. And this crisp cutoff, so we actually know something about from random matrix theory, when a system is uncorrelated, we know the shape of the density, the distribution of the eigenvalues, and we also know something about the edge statistics. And this is very important. In this case, the edge statistics are Tracy Wood. Uh, now, and, and again, for those of you who like code, uh, basically all I'm doing here is I'm, I'm going to take some pre-trained neural networks, like a model out of Keras. I'm going to get the weights. I'm going to just form uh, the correlation matrix, compute the eigenvalues, and get a histogram. Um, and that's basically what we're looking at. And we can do this. Notice I don't need to look at any of the test data to do this. I'm just looking at the weight matrices directly. Now, it turns out, when you do this, if, you're, if you look at any of the pre-trained neural networks out there, things trained on ImageNet, like VGG, Inception, ResNet, DenseNet, SqueezeNet, pick any of the neural networks that are out there and do this for all the weight matrices and take a look at them. You'll find that in some cases you have this Gaussian random matrix. This is what it would look like. This is usually what your initial weight matrix looks like. If you were to plot the initial guess, this is what you would see in the histogram. If you look at smaller, older models, or in this case, moderate batch sizes, you would see that there's a bulk region, which corresponds to the marchenko pasteur region we just talked about, and there are some spikes that appear out here. Small, older models like Lynette 5 behave like this, um, and, and most of the information becomes contrary in the spikes. If you look at any other neural network, for example, and I think in this case, these are the uh, layers of inception, you, you start to see the onset of heavy-tailed behavior. You either see this, this region with sort of uh, the edge statistics, or this is clearly, there's no crisp edge. It, it bleeds out here from the edge, and there are these spikes. And over time, you, begin, you can see in other systems that you form these heavy-tailed empirical distributions. So what happens is when you're, when you're training a neural network, you see this breakdown of Gaussian random structure. The weight matrices are not Gaussian. They're certainly not described by a Gaussian spin glass. Um, you, and all of them exhibit this type of self-regularization. So I'm, I'm going to dig into the details a little bit here. So the, the idea being that there, in addition to the Marchinko-Pasteur theory, it turns out there's another variant of random matrix theory, which is heavy-tailed. And what this theory says is that if I were to take this, this, you, this says if I take a random matrix where I draw the elements of the random matrix from some heavy-tailed distribution, like a Pareto distribution, and I form the correlation matrix, and I normalize it in this way, where gamma is 1. And, and pay attention, this normalization is going to be important later and when you do this. In this case, it, you form the spectral density. It's a power law. And in fact, it's related to how you draw it. So it, it's linear. When mu is less than 2, you get a very simple power law expression. When mu is between 2 and 4, you also get a linear expression, but there are strong finite size, effect, finite size effects. So the takeaway being, when you form a random heavy-tailed matrix, the spectral, the spectral density is also random, and you can actually say something very, rigor very strongly about uh, what the power law exponent is. Um, and so this is a good example, an example in this case. Uh, this is for AlexNet, one of the layers that AlexNet zoomed in. This is what the marchenko pasteur theory would look like, and you see that, in fact, this is, it fits much better to a power law spectrum, a heavy tail, than it, was, than it would a... Gaussian random structure. And, and the key here is that I'm not saying that the, the weight matrices of a neural network are, are random heavy-tailed matrices. I'm saying that you can, you can, if W is strongly correlated, the weight matrices are very strongly correlated, they capture all the information about the data, then you can model W as if it's drawn from a heavy-tailed distribution. So this is a much better model for looking at neural networks than, say, looking at Gaussian model. And this is, these are ideas that come from um, polymer theory, um, and also developed in the early 90s. I was familiar when I was a postdoc. Uh, mostly developed in polymer theory, but also for quantitative finance by Beauchamp and Potters and um, their colleagues. Yes? Are all the histograms from a single layer or the weights over the entire network? One, one layer. One layer matrix. So one, one layer. To we're going to look at one weight, one matrix at a time. And... Um, so what happens is now we talk about there are these, I'm just going to kind of go review the uh, random matrix theory, then I'll go into the specific details of how we computed those matrices. Can I ask question? A similar question? Sir? Sure. 
Does it matter which layer you're looking at? Do they have different? Well, they'll be a little bit different, but it turns out that there's universal behavior. And what I'm going to show you is that there's universality. All of the weight matrices, we've, I've looked at over almost 10,000 weight matrices. Uh, weight matrices and feature maps. So if you look at a convolutional layer, I extract out each of the individual feature maps. They all display, 90% of them, 80-90% display heavy tail behavior. And uh, with power law exponents that are in a very, very specific um, universality class. So it, it turns out that um, most people in random matrix theory, they may be familiar with the Gaussian random matrix, like Wigner, Marchenko, Pasteur. Uh, there's a, a model called spiked covariance, uh, which, which is basically Marchenko, Pasteur plus a perturbation. But there are all these other heavy-tailed universality classes. I mean, I mean, even put them all in there. There's also, there's also a couple universality classes for mu equals four and mu equals two. So there's a whole range of universality classes. And they have this very interesting behavior. Uh, we call them the ones where mu equals mu is less than two. We call them very heavy-tailed. In the physics literature, sometimes these are called levy matrices. The, when, between, when mu is between two and four, we call them moderately heavy-tailed or fat-tailed. In the physics literature, some people call this fat-tailed. You have to be careful. Sometimes they call these fat-tailed. But I'll refer to these as very heavy-tailed. These as fat-tailed. And then when mu is less than four, excuse me, when four is less than mu, you get this sort of weakly heavy-tailed behavior. And you almost can't distinguish between spiked covariance and weakly heavy-tailed. But the, the characteristic thing here is that in, in normal Gaussian matrix, Gaussian random matrix theory, the edge statistics are governed by Tracy Whittem. In the heavy tail situation, of course, there is no edge, but the maximum eigenvalue is governed by a Frechet distribution with very, uh, and, and is scale invariant. And this is going to be the key to developing a capacity theory for, for neural networks. So I'm going to show you it uh, very shortly. Can I ask a question? Of course. Can you move uh, the slides before when you have you compared the different classes of? Uh, what do you want to do? Uh, you had one, the uh, maybe two or three slides before. This? Yeah. Yes. Are the matrix dimensions similar? These are all, in this case, I, I was going to talk about this a little later. We probably won't get to it. So I'll just give you the, the juicy center of the lollipop, as I always tell Michael. In this case, I took a, a F, this is FC1 from a, a miniature version of AlexNet. And what is, I did is I ran this 10 times. So I took the average of the ESD, so you get a nice pretty picture. And then we decreased the batch size systematically. 500, 250, 150, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2. And when you systematically decrease the batch size on the same model, you see that the system goes through this series of changes and moves from something like a Gaussian random matrix to a series of bulk plus spikes to completely heavy tailed. So we can simulate, we can actually induce all of these changes and go through all the different universality classes. I'm just wondering, in the bottom row, you have this very large, like modern. DNA. Yes. So does it mean it's like you have tons of more weights compared to the... No, there, this is, in this case, it's the same. But what, what I'm trying to show here is just basically what the theory looks like, like what the different pictures. I'm going to go into detail on it now. I'll, uh, bear with me for a minute. Let me, let me explain what I've done. So we're going to look... The way I did this, I tried to avoid doing any kind of simulations whatsoever. Because I knew if I started running simulations, I would uh, spend all my time trying to figure out how to run simulations. So instead, I said, well, what's a way I can actually do theory without having to actually generate any, any data. Well, well, there are all these pre-trained neural networks that are available. There's probably at least 50 of them. Image, you know, all trained on ImageNet, trained on NLP, BERT models, a whole ton of them. So I said, let's look at all of these. And let's examine the weight matrices of these trained networks. And we're going to look at, we're going to actually look at them and see what they look like. So in this case, you're going to see, I'm going to show you a whole range of different kinds of weight matrices. And I'll show you where the heavy tail behavior arises. Yeah, I was just a little bit concerned with you. The matrix is very small. Would it be possible but, to oh, I, just because of this? Yeah, I, I, we, have, we have to restrict it to some reasonable size, like over 50 or 100. And we do very careful statistical tests to ensure that we know what we're looking at. Yeah, the, like we don't look at matrices less than by 50. You can't see anything. There's not enough data. Um, so, but some of these matrices like, with, are, are quite large. So uh, I'll show, some of them we look at, like we look, for example, I retrained uh, Linet 5. I couldn't find a version of Linet 5. So I retrained Lynette 5, which is the first neural network developed by Lee Kun. Um, and in this case, uh, there's just, it's basically 2D convolution max pool, 2D convolution max pool, fully connected, fully connected layer. And what I'm going to show you are, uh, in our first paper, we just looked at the fully connected layers, which are quite large. You know, at least, you know, a couple, I can't remember, I mean, a couple, you know, 
of order a thousand, of order a hundred or a thousand. So they're quite large. AlexNet, we look at Inception, ResNet, DenseNet. We look at all these different kinds. We're basically going to extract the weights on, look at different architectures, and look at how the, what the behavior of the, what universality classes the weight matrix live in. So, for example, with Lynette 5, uh, in this case, this is Lynette 5. I think this is, this is probably, uh, probably FC1 because it's, the weight matrix looks like it fits very clearly to um, a marchico Pasteur distribution and you have some spikes that exist and the maximum eigenvalue is up here around 20 or 30, 25, 30. And um, it, it fits very, very well. It's a very good fit to a marchenko pasture distribution. So this is what this is what that five looks like. So, and this is a fairly large, I think this is fairly large matrix. You can see the fits pretty good, just visually. Alex then on the other hand, this is FC1 and Alex Net. If you look at the, the layer, it almost looks like it could fit marchenko pasture. And remember that this fit, th this fit does, does not only depends on the aspect ratio and the variance. So the aspect ratio is fixed. We know what that is. So all we're doing is basically adjusting what we assume is the, is the, the empirical variance of the system. But you get this, this, this bleeding out region here. So it's not, so you don't see Tracy Wooden tail sets. And you really, one of the interesting things about random matrix series, it tells you that it gives you very, very tight bounds on the edge statistics. So you really can say, how much bleeding out you should see. And this is, and we talk about this in great detail in the paper. This is much larger than what you would expect to see from Tracy Whittem. And if we, this is, uh, unfortunately I put FC2 there, um, but it's the same idea that when you zoom in, you see that this bulk region doesn't really get filled in. Even though this is a histogram, you do different kinds of histograms or kernel density estimator, it just doesn't really work and you get this bleeding out like this. And so we begin to see that what we call is, this is a bulk decay and or heavy tail. We have sort of a, this bulk decay universality. We, we have a, a phenomenology where we might say this is a bulk decay and or really it's heavy tailed. If you look at um, Inception, another example of Inception, you look at Inception, it actually has this sort of weird multimodal structure. Um, I think in this case Q is one. Uh, and this is layer, two, one, one of the linear layers that we were able to extract out of Inception. I can go into some detail later how I got that out of there. But you can see this is, it doesn't really fit Marchenko pasture at all. It's, it's clearly, there's structure in this. Um, it really doesn't, if anything, it's a heavy tail distribution with a little bit of extra correlation in it. So we begin to see in all of these models the onset of these heavy tails. Um, we, we also, it turns out you can also look for rank collapse. Another example we see in all these models, uh, when Q is greater than one, you should not expect to see any eigenvalues near zero. And so this is another thing I'll show you in the paper we talk about. Not only do you see these heavy, the marchenko pasture loss theory actually tells you that um, you really should, there should be a cutoff region for the tail. And what we find is that when we see rank collapse, in other words, when you see zero eigenvalues, that this seems to signify a type of over-regularization. And we, we can verify this ex uh, as well. This, by the way, this is also known in systems like uh, GANs. They have the same, this, it turns out this year, this is a paper that came out that also shows this, that, you, that the, in training of generative, in training of GANs, that you also want to try to avoid rank collapse. Now, so the, the theory would say that in very small models, like Lynette Fon, smaller older models, they exhibit this sort of bulk plus spike behavior. And we can predict exactly, you can predict where lambda max is going to occur and relate it back to the, the structure of the original matrix, but the point is that, that they, all these small models look like this, and they can be described perturbatively using Gaussian random matrix theory. And what you see is that there's a scale cutoff. So recall before we talked about Tinkinoff regularization and this idea that Tinkinoff regularization, our familiar form of machine learning regularization, is characterized by this uh, scale cutoff. Well, that scale cutoff is alpha. So in the older neural networks, what we see is a softer rank in the weight matrices. And we can show that the spikes, which lay above alpha, which is this sort of the, the edge of the bulk, in our case alpha being the edge of the bulk, carry most of the information. And we, have a, in a, we go into great detail in our pedagogic paper about showing that this is where the information is concentrated. In, in a larger networks, in, very, in almost every other well, large, well-trained, modern, deep neural network. It doesn't look like this at all. 
it displays a type of scale-free behavior. We can fit the spectral density to a power law. We use it, we do the um, maximum likelihood method by Clausen, which is the standard acceptable method. We can look at um, uh, a quality metric and all of these, and we go into great detail, but all of these show very, very strong power law fits within a certain bounded region. All of these networks seem to exhibit heavy-tailed self-regularization. We've looked at AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, Inception. There's a wide range of them. And if you're a physicist, you're jumping up and down right now because you, you understand what this means. You know, it, it, but even more, not only can we see it, we, I decided to look at every single weight matrix I could find. So I got every single pre-trained model. Uh, and we built a tool to do this. And we looked at about 10,000 weight matrices and did all these power wall fits. And this is what we find. So, for example, in this case, we looked at all of the ImageNet models that are distributed in PyTorch today. And we make a histogram plot of these are the power law exponents. And what we find is that it, it's difficult to even plot it, but basically, because you, you, it's difficult to do the counting, we have a huge number all lie within two to four. These are, these are, the, um, they, they, these are the linear layers. These are the linear layers in the ImageNet models. And they all have lie within two. There's a couple of outliers, two outliers. But of all the ImageNet models, we found they all have power law exponents between two and four. In, uh, in, there's maybe one outlier here, which is a little less than two, which is probably numerical error. In the Allen NLP models, we took the six Allen NLP models and looked at their weight matrices. Those are all linear, including these very, very large, they're very, very large attention matrices. So these matrices can be like several thousand by 25,000. So they're very large. They also all, they're, for the most part, there are a few more outliers, but for the most part, 80, 90% are in this range. So all the ImageNet models display a remarkable type of universality of the power law exponent. And again, if you're a physicist, you're jumping up and down going, wow, that's except my, which is pretty remarkable. We now look at, now I, I look at over 50 architectures. I take the linear layers, each individual linear layer, and I also take the convolutional, the feature maps from the convolutional 2D layers. And it's difficult to see from the histogram, but I, can, I can't remember the exact number, but between 80 and 90% of, of all these exponents lie within this region. Some of the very smaller convolutional layers you asked about, some of them show they seem to be, they have smaller exponents. So we're not sure if that's real or if that's just numerical error. But for the most part, you see almost 80% at least are fat-tailed. They live in this fat-tailed universality class. <coughs> This, and this is for ImageNet, and we see similar behavior for, again, NLP models. Likewise, uh, in terms of rank collapse, we look at all these ImageNet models, we see one, a few layers exhibit rank collapse, which we, add in, in the ImageNet models, none of the Allen NLP models displayed any kind of rank collapse. So th this is basically saying, you know, we're coming to this picture now where if you were to look at a neural network and it's very well trained, you expect it to have small power law exponents, you, and you don't expect there to be any rank collapse. Now, th there, there are exceptions. Okay, we, there are exceptions. Here's a, here's a big one I've looked at recently. This is BERT, which you guys know what BERT is. It's a new model that came out of Google. It has over 5,000 layers. Uh, for an, it won um, a big contest in natural language processing, I think the squid or the squad contest. It displays universality, but in fact, there's, a, there's actually quite a number of models. There's actually some layers that show all rank collapse. There's one layer that has like all the eigenvalues are zero. It's really weird. Maybe they're like one non-zero eigenvalue. And there's, a, there's some heavy tail, there's some very, very weakly heavy tail behavior out here. So I think in this case, maybe 50, 60%. So I sort of have a, a, a conjecture. You know, if you're gonna be a scientist, you have to conjecture things. You have to go out there. I would say that BERT isn't optimized yet. That they could probably do a lot better. It probably doesn't need to be as big. It's probably oh, it has too much capacity. And even though it's done very well, I, I sort of have a conjecture that it could be, and I'm sure maybe in you know, two years from now, there'll be a new model out which outperforms BERT, but we'll see. Okay, now, what I'm gonna show you now are all new results, which I um, try to convince Michael to finish reading the paper. Uh, but it's all new results that we're working on. Uh, now I'm going to show you that this universality allows me to create a complexity metric, or what you call a capacity metric. And I can use this to predict the generalization accuracy of a neural network. So what I'm going to do, uh, so what does this mean? So the idea is that if all of these neural networks, all the weight matrices display universal power law behavior, then why can't we just invent a capacity metric, which is something like the, the 
weighted average of all the power levels. So you take a large neural network, something like BERT, maybe, has, maybe something has like a thousand layers. You measure the power law exponent for all of them. And then you, there's some weight factor. You take a weighted average. Well, what should the weight factor be? Well, well the weight factor should be of order the scale of the matrix. Or, or so it should be somewhere related to the scale of the matrix. In other words, small matrices should not contribute as much as large matrices because you don't know them as well. So, so look, I'm a physicist. I'm just going to invent a capacity metric and I'm going to see what happens. But you know, so what we've done here is we're going to create an unsupervised VC-like data-dependent complexity metric that can predict trends in the average case generalization accuracy. I'm trying to do average case. I want to basically take a neural network, look at, look at a series of neural networks, and can I predict which one will generalize better. So to do this, uh, and it turns out you can't do this. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll try to jump forward and show you. Just to convince you, this does work. So for example, if you take this capacity metric and you apply it to the series of VGG models, VGG 11 with and without batch norm, and you look here, this, this is the average complexity metric, average weighted alpha, and this is the reported test accuracy, you get an almost perfect linear correlation. Uh, if you do it for ResNet, and you look at all the, re all the entire series of ResNet models, 10, 12, 14, 16, ALD 18, 30, 50, you get, you, you should see, as the, as the error goes down, the average power law exponent goes down. The weighted average goes down. So it seems to work. We, and we have a paper I'm trying to write. We've done this now with all the potential, every architecture we could find. And it works consistently well. There are a few um, outliers, but you know, every theory has some exceptions. So I'm going to talk about where, why does this work? Why, why does this work? So the reason I'm going to go look and back at how do people normally measure complexity metrics? So one measure uh, is a nice paper that came out by Hittery and Poggio and coworkers, uh, which looks at product norms. And they claim that they can predict, they say that the, the, the bounds, the VC bounds using a product norm on a neural network are very, very tight. But in order to do this, they had to retrain the network and they had to like, change what the loss function was. I, I don't want to do any of that. You know, I, I just want to look at the pre-trained network directly without any modification. But still, we can use their idea. We start off with this product norm, where this is the product norm uh, being their measure of capacity. Well, we take the log of the product norm, and instead of having, now it gives us an average log norm. So we have a capacity metric, which would look something like the average log for Venus norm of a neural network. And I just ask myself, well, does that work? You know, can, can I just apply it to these pre-trained networks? And you know, it's not bad. You know, it actually kind of works. You, you can take the average power law, uh, average Frobenius power law norm, and you, you actually see a, a nice correlation. And this, this works consistently well across a large number of pre-trained architectures. In other words, we can predict trends in the test accuracy of a neural network without ever peeking at the test data. And uh, I don't think anyone's ever pointed this out. Maybe they have, I'm not a specialist in, in neural network capacity, but it just seemed like something you should do. And when I'm working with clients, it seemed like something that would be useful. So we tried it and it seemed to work. What does this have to do with the weighted average? In fact, I claim we can even do better if we do weighted average alpha. But first, we need to do this. We need to relate the Frobenius norm, which is what machine learning people are familiar with, to the power law exponent. And then we have to figure out what the weights are. So now I'm going to show you how to do that. So recall that. Random matrix theory tells us if we draw a random matrix from something like a Pareto distribution, it's a tail. We expect the tail to behave like this. So I'm just going to draw a random matrix. It tells us that we form the correlation matrix. We can say something about the spectral density. Now here, here's the kick. If you normally when you form the correlation matrix, you, you normalize by one over n. In the theory, when you're trying to prove the heavy tail theory, you have to normalize by one over n to the two over mu. That's how if you read all the papers, this is what they do. So the Frobenius norm, this power law relationship is going to depend on how we normalize our correlation matrix. And rather than go through all the math, I just want to give you some intuition for what's going on. So let's suppose, and, and what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to form these different matrices, compute their eigenvalue spectrum, and we're going to look at this relation, which is the log of the Frobenius norm squared, log of Frobenius norm squared to the log of the maximum eigenvalue. It's, it's sometimes what I call the log is the soft rank in log units. It's familiar to something like the soft rank, where this would be the Frobenius norm, and this is the spectral norm, and you take the log by the log. And I'm going to compare this to the actual power law exponent and see how it behaves. 
because this is what we want. We want a relation between the Frobenius norm and the parallel exponent. So let's do it first for uh, uh, code. I always like to show code so people know what's going on. So I basically import NumPy. I import this package called PowerLaw, which implements the uh, standard MLE solution for fitting power laws, which is OK. Um, I form a ran I, I choose various values of n and m and mu. I form a random Pareto matrix, take the dot product, normalize it by n or by n to the one, 2 over mu, get the eigenvalues, get the power law fit, compute the log norm, compute the maximum eigenvalues, and compute this ratio. Yeah. So if we do this, if we do it for the scale free case, the normalization is, t is n to the 2 over mu, the relation is very weakly scale dependent. It turns out that the Frobenius norm of a random heavy-tailed matrix is dominated by the maximum eigenvalue. But this is when, you're, when you have scale invariant normalization. This, this is what it means to be scale invariant. It means that there's a single eigenvalue which is dominating the structure. And if you look, and you look at here between mu, between 1 and 2, it's a fairly tight linear relationship. I mean, there's some variance that's tight. When you start getting mu's greater than 2, it sort of decays. So this is well known. This is well known in the theoretical physics literature for Levy matrices. Well, well known result. If, uh, of course, when you're doing this in a practical setting, I don't know what mu is. In fact, I don't even know if I have a mu. And because I said we're, we're modeling these matrices as if they were heavy tail. As if they, we're modeling the correlation matrix as if the weight matrix was some sort of random heavy tailed matrix from this universality class. So I don't know mu. So instead, I'll use my normal. I'll use my standard normalization. And when I do this, I get a very nice relation between the log of the Frobenius norm, alpha times log max. It's actually very linear, very tight and linear, all the way up to about 2, and then it saturates. So large Fredo matrices have a very simple limiting normal. This is for q equals 1, m is 1,000. m is 1,000. I think it's, actually, I think this is 10,000, not 1,000. So, these are fairly, this is a fairly good relationship. It's very tight for large matrices. But here's the kicker. We're in this region between two and four, this universality class, we call it the fat tailed universality class. This is also known for, in physics, I don't know, it's in physics it's known, this has extremely large finite size effects. In fact, if you study this using renormalization group theory, this class of distributions, you would find that there's an attractor in the finite size, which is very important because the finite, in any fine, even though in the infinite limit, it's power law. It will behave in a certain way. In the finite size, you, you excuse me, my throat's a little dry. It, it has completely different behavior in the finite size. And what you find is if you do just pick Q equals 1 and just vary the size. So N is M, and I just vary the size up to 10,000. So the red line was 10,000. You see that when you get into the size of the matrices we see in deep learning, which are between 100 and 500 eigenvalues, maybe 1,000, you actually see an almost linear relationship. So it turns out that the relation between the log norm and alpha log max is actually nearly linear both for very heavy-tailed and even for these fat-tailed finite size matrices. And so that's what we're going to use. And we're going to find out that there's a, these finite size proto matrices. Remember, this is just simulated data will actually have this universal norm power law relation. And I, I forgot to put it in the talk, but in fact, if you go and you look inside the weight matrices for something like VGG19, you will actually find plots that look just like this. So the actual real matrices inside neural networks actually exhibit these kinds of strong finite size effects. So we create a weighted alpha metric. Uh, we, for each linear layer, we just take you know, we just take the weight matrix for that layer. I don't include the bias term. For convolutional 2D layers, I have n um, feature maps, and I just take the sum over all the feature maps, and you just take an average. And there are, you know, there are a couple different ways you can take the average, but we just do something trivial. Um, and now we have a relation. We can go from the log capacity, the, capa the, log, the average log norm, which is from our, our product norm capacity. We can replace the Frobenius norm squared uh, with our weighted, the average, the average log for me is from square with our alpha term because uh, uh, with our average alpha where, where the alpha is basically the sum over log max times the power law exponent for each of our layer weight matrices. 
And so this gives us this weighted alpha complexity metric. And if we, we apply it, we see it does very, very well for VGG, the VGG series. It does very well, uh, not as obviously as one, but quite well for the whole series of ResNet. We have similar results for ShuffleNet, DenseNet, SqueezeNet, MobileNet, FDMobile. I have a whole series of results I can show you afterwards for virtually every single neural network you find. I think I only found two, maybe three counterexamples over the entire, of all the, um, all the models I could find that were pre-trained. Uh, and so we wrote a tool, we called it Weight Watcher, because you want to analyze the fat tails in your deep neural network, we call it Weight Watcher. Pip install Weight Watcher, and all you have to do, it works right now, it runs on Keras and PyTorch. So you just import it, you put your model in, you say analyze, it will give you a summary and present the results. You can just say pip install, it's also available on my blog on GitHub called Calculated Content, the Calculation Consulting blog, so github.com, Calculated Content, Weight Watcher, and it's all there. And so the, the nice part about these results is that everything's completely reproducible. You have a tool, you can download the tool, you can go to PyTorch, you can get the pre-trained neural networks, just run the tool on the layers and make the plots yourself and you'll see this is all, uh, and, and, we, and the tool actually supports both the log, the average log Frobenius norm, which is a very fast network, very quick and dirty, and the weighted alpha, which is incredibly slow because it has to both compute the singular value decomposition and do the power law fit. So, but it does work. And, and we're, we, we distribute the tools, we're hoping people will try this and, and really see, does, is this useful or is this just, you know, is, is it useful or not? So I'm, I'm gonna stop there. Um, if you want, I also, we have a whole series of work we've done on analyzing what happens with implicit self organization when we start decreasing the batch sizes. So that, that's more work. We have a whole, I could go for another hour talking about these various Ten kinds minutes. of phases of training and, Ten uh, but I thought this, you want me to go to the 10 minutes? Uh, are there any questions now? I see if anyone has any questions to ask. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, so early when I started learning capacity, people told me, and let's talk physics, people told me you can come up with, with various ways of measuring capacity, but it ultimately needs to be a volume. Because all capacities are a volume. And I was wondering if you, if you could make that connection to me. Well, uh, so the question is, can we relate the capacity to a volume? Yeah, that's how they used to do statistical mechanics as well, the volume and phase fit. Exactly. So, um, capacity is the volume. Well, I didn't think about it. I mean, you have to relate it back to, you know, what does it mean to have this parallel exponent? I mean, we relate it back to the Frobenius norm. Right. So can you relate the Frobenius norm to a volume? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know. I'll think <laughs> about it. I mean, I, it's a reasonable thing to ask, yeah. That's, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. That's fine, sure. Right. But okay. It should be the case of the larger, the, parallel, the small the parallel exponent is the larger some of the eigenvalues are, meaning the spectrum one is larger. So it's a smaller volume, so there's, there's a... Well, I, just, I just don't know the space, right? I mean, we can relate to this, we can relate to various measures of rank, like the soft rank and the stable rank. It's very clear that you're decreasing. I, I think more of the question would be like a volume of phase space. What we sort of expect is that... That's what you do, right? No, but that should be the curva, rugged curvature of this rugged convexity picture. Well, yeah, there, there's this picture we have of energy landscape theory that there's an information entropy bottleneck. And so in, in, we talk about the information bottleneck in machine learning, but in, in physics, this comes from field theory, the idea that there's a trade-off or just really thermodynamics, right? There's a, you know, the free energy is the energy minus Ts, which is the entropy. So there's a trade-off between energy and entropy. And what you expect is that as the entropy decreases, that the total phase space will decrease. And this would be the complete volume in phase space. And this is actually where we started this work, thinking about how do we measure the entropy of a neural network and relate it back to some volume and phase space. And I said, well, you know, the entropy, I tried doing this using some techniques from statistical mechanics. And then I realized, you know, why don't I just look at the weight matrices and relate the entropy to the weight matrix? And we found we could get a lot more structure out of just by looking at the random matrix theory and relating that back. So you know, there are relations that you can go back between making various kinds of models and looking at the global landscape of the, um, uh, of, of the problem, and I think that's one of the things we would, you know, we'd like to do in the future. Um, um, a question? More than a question, a, a remark. The complexity metric that you use uh, looks very similar to the Hausdorff dimension of the network. Oh, that could be. Yeah. That, that could be. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, the, obviously these are, the, because it, the, the statement is that the complexity metric looks like the Hausdorff dimension. Uh, 
That could be because you're near parallel exponents, so you expect to be a fractal, and that could be the fractal dimension. I hadn't thought of that, but that's an excellent observation. That would be a good news because then it's actually volume. And that's the volume. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so that we had to put that in the paper before we publish. We'll, okay, that's got to go there. Uh, uh, other questions? Okay, I, I can leave it, or we can you know, do some more, or anyone else. I, basically, I would just say that. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is something that's come up by looking at, you know, looking at these different models that come from. Uh, the, these models like spin glasses of minimal frustration were things that were really developed in, uh, in protein folding. And it was really this, this idea that Michael and I started talking about understanding this thing called the Wolnitz funnel. And it was really this, this I, I made a blog, um, I conjectured this back in 2015 that you would actually see this kind of behavior, not having any ideas from random matrix theory. Uh, got on Hacker News was on there for like my 15 minutes of fame on Hacker News, got a lot of trolls complaining, and you know, it's taken me about, now I think about it's almost four years to figure out how to relate what is the spin glass of minimal frustration, which is a rise in, polymer, in protein folding, which is a somewhat ethereal concept, to something which is very, very practical, such as these bulk plus spike models, and then relating that into things like heavy tail random matrix theory. So it's been a, a very long journey in starting with something that was very vague, and kind of ethereal and trying to take this very vague ethereal thing and turn it into re and to reduce it to pip install and that, that I think for me that that's really sort of my uh, the best part is to be able to take all these ideas and reduce it to a tool which we can give to people and they can actually use so we, we try to develop some doing something which is deeply theoretical but also something which is ultimately practical which was the the goal of this work all along so I just want to thank Michael for, you know, he's been a great collaborator. I call him up every day and all, all, every week, all sorts of hours of the night and uh, talk about this stuff. And it's been, uh, you know, it's good to have someone looking over your shoulder to make sure you're, you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's correctly and getting all the math right. Because this is, it's very, very technical stuff. And I've had to sort through, you know, old physics and the, you know, old papers in the theoretical physics literature to dig out some of these heavy tailed results. It's, it's not, these things are not very well known and they're certainly not described in a way which is, um, you know, uh, digestible. So a part of the goal is we've also tried to take some of these theoretical ideas and, and to develop a phenomenology and explain them to people so you can actually start using them. So I'll, I'll close it off there. All right. Okay. Any other uh, questions? And if you want to grab Charles, I think he'll be around for a little bit for the, the munchies and whatnot afterwards. So if there's nothing else in this form. He'll be around for a little bit. I yeah, guess. I'll hang out for a minute. You All got right, it. Thanks a lot. All right, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs>